We're talking about the correct use or the proper use or the right use of the Old Testament. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 44 through 46, we read this. After His resurrection, Jesus said to His disciples, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the Law of Moses and in the Prophets and in the Psalms concerning Me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. When it says that he opened their eyes to the Scriptures, that means he opened their eyes to understand that what Moses and the Psalms and the prophets were writing about was his suffering. That is, his redemptive suffering on the cross, his death on the cross, and then his rising from the dead. Now we've looked at what Moses had to say about it. We've looked at what the Psalms had to say about it. Now let's look briefly at what the prophets uh, had to say about it. Um, we could spend a lot of time in the prophets, but I'm going to confine my remarks today just to the prophet Isaiah because he has such beautiful and obvious references to Jesus. Really, if the truth were told, if we had the time to do it, and if we had the insight to do it, you know, it said here that Jesus opened their understanding. If we had sufficient opening of our understanding, I believe we could read every word and every story and every incident from the Old Testament and see that it's pointing towards Christ. Nothing is in there accidentally. Nothing is in there to no purpose. It all points us to Christ. Everything in the Bible is about Christ. So we could say that when you've come to Christ, when you have Jesus, you really do have all that you need. And even if you didn't have a Bible, you're already perfectly set and have everything that you need. But having a Bible, you have the extra added blessing of having the opportunity to look for all these insightful, um, revealing symbols of Jesus and His redemptive work. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call His name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. This is an obvious reference to Jesus quoted in, in the Gospels at the birth of Jesus. Emmanuel means that through Jesus, God is now with us. God is not at a distance, but because of Jesus, the mediator between God and man, we are now, uh, God is now with us. As it says in the book of Revelation, He will dwell in the same tent with them. He will tabernacle with them. That's not something that's coming in the future. That's talking about this very thing that the word Emmanuel means. It's God with us. Right now, we can say, greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. He already lives in the same tent with you. Isaiah chapter 9, another uh, picture of Jesus, verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth. Now this is another very obvious prophecy about Jesus. I like the fact that it says the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Jesus is not a soon coming king. He's already king. He has been exalted to the right hand of God and He is now King and ruler and Lord. That's why we say Jesus is Lord because He is Lord. He rules not by force but by the free will of those who come to Him and submit to Him and call Him Lord. He is Lord and uh, those who acknowledge Him as Lord uh, come into His kingdom. And it says of the increase of His government and peace there shall be no end. His kingdom is an increasing kingdom. His government is an increasing government. And whenever someone comes to Christ or puts their faith in Christ, His government increases a little more. We read in a previous uh, message from Psalm 110 that Jesus now sits at the right hand of God, waiting until all of His enemies be made His footstool. His government and His uh, kingdom will be increasing and increasing and increasing till everyone, till every knee bows and every tongue acknowledges that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Isaiah 53 is uh, the most obvious reference to Jesus. Let me turn and let's just spend a little time in Isaiah chapter 53 because it's such a, uh, a wonderful chapter. It begins this way, Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He, speaking of Jesus, shall grow up before Him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He does not have any form or comeliness. That means majesty. That when we shall see Him, there, there is no beauty that we should desire Him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. 
He was despised and we esteemed Him not. Now when it describes Jesus as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, we picture Him as this downcast, sad, and sorrowful person. But the next verse tells us that it was not His own sorrow and not His own grief, but it was our sorrows and our griefs that He was carrying. Verse 4, Surely He has borne our griefs. He carried our sorrows. And we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on Him. And with His stripes, we're healed. Now, Jesus never committed any transgressions, but you and I did. He was wounded for our transgressions. That means what we had coming to us, what we deserved by way of God's judgment on our transgressions, fell instead upon Jesus. That's the meaning of His redemptive substitutionary work on the cross. He took our place. So He was wounded for our transgressions. He took what should have been coming to us. And with His stripes, we're healed. In other words, because of what He suffered, we're made whole. Spirit, soul, and body. Verse 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. We have each turned to His own way. Now, I don't know why anybody would read this and stop reading right there, but I've heard it that way many times. Preachers and different you know, individuals will say, You know, you're like sheep. We're all like sheep. We've all gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. But that's not the end of the statement. He says, Here's the Lord's solution to it. Rather than go after the sheep that have gone astray and beat them and chastise them, it says, The Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. All the sheep that went astray, God judged that by putting all of their iniquity on Jesus, who's called the Lamb of God. Verse 7, He was oppressed, He was afflicted, and yet He opened not His mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So He opened not His mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare His generation? For He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of My people was He stricken. And He made His grave with the wicked and with the rich in His death, because He had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in His mouth. Look at verse 10 in Isaiah 53. Yet it it pleased the Lord to bruise Him. It pleased God. It pleased. See, it was the Lord who did this. It wasn't the Romans. It wasn't the Jews. It wasn't even you and me. It was the Lord who did this. It was God's plan from the beginning of time to punish Jesus in your place. It was never God's plan to punish you for your sins. It was always God's plan to punish Jesus in your place. It says, It pleased the Lord to bruise Him. He hath put Him to grief. Uh, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide with him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. The transgressors are you and me. But Jesus was numbered. In other words, He identified with you and I. He was numbered with the transgressors. And He bore the sin of many. And He made intercession for the transgressors. Now sometimes when we read this word intercession, we imagine somebody praying a prayer. But an intercessor is not somebody who prays a prayer. An intercessor is a person who takes the place of another person. So Jesus is the true intercessor. The only true intercessor. He made intercession for the transgressors not by praying a prayer. The transgressors are you and me. And He made intercession for us not by praying a little prayer for us, but by jumping in and taking our place and taking the judgment that we deserve and taking the wrath of God that was due to us. And so it pleased the Lord to bruise Him in our place. He was numbered with the transgressors. He made intercession for us by taking our place and absorbing in His own body all the wrath that was due to our sins. So that's Isaiah chapter 53, a pretty clear picture of Jesus. Let's go on quickly to chapter 61 of Isaiah. I'd like to read this to you. Another direct prophecy about Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for He hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to all them that are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of the vengeance of our God, and to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, and the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. Now we know this is talking about Jesus because He quoted it in the Gospels. But notice the end result of it is that you and I, those who believe in Him, are called trees of righteousness, planted not by ourselves, but planted by the Lord.